So I like to introduce you all to Juju. This is a, a Juju one on one on one talk. Okay, and so um, feel free to ask any questions. I think that it would be great if we would start by speaking kind of a common language. Every tool, every kind of high level abstraction, you end up using terminology uh, and words in a specific you know way to mean certain things. And so what I'd like us to all do is all speak Juju. And then I think it'll be great throughout this week because then we'll all know what we're talking about. So the first thing, uh, this is kind of a running joke, you need to define what the cloud is, and, and my answer is not, it's someone else's computer. Um, it's actually, for us, it's one of the substrates that you can deploy applications and run things on. So uh, MAS, bare metal, uh, like speed for machine containers, uh, the big clouds, Google, Azure, uh, smaller clouds, your open stacks, those are all clouds that we will end up using to deploy things to. And when it comes to the cloud, Juju has commands to help understand and look at and, and know what clouds things are working on and what are available. Juju Clouds will actually list them out. You can get details in the cloud. So for instance, if I run Juju Clouds, I get this list. Juju ships out of the box understanding how to talk to clouds, right? And this is a lovely API-driven world. Juju basically just speaks APIs out to the cloud and says, give me things that I would like so that I can put together my model and make it real. And this is kind of the building block that Mark was talking about. The building block you need is the cloud to understand, you know, to perform actions to help make your model reality. So here you can see you've got you know, Google join it. Um, let's use a little close. Uh, and then one thing I want to call out and note, the very last one on this, UE Maz, is my own Maz that I run in my basement. So while the cloud list comes shipped by default, you obviously can add your own for open stacks, Maz, and other clouds that you know about, as long as you can support and understand that. So, as part of a cloud, you need a credential. Um, and we're handing out cloud credentials to help you get started. But I know a lot of us who do a lot of work in the cloud, we tend to have lots of credentials. I've got ones from the QA system at work that I can use to help test stuff. I've got my personal credentials that I can use to run my own software on the side. I've got uh, customer things where they want me to try stuff. And so, Juju fully supports uh, adding multiple credentials into the, to be understood for the different clouds. So this helps you deploy your things in a way that the right billing goes to the right place, right? Because you don't want to pay for all that stuff. Again, you can add credentials, list them. Auto looks really interesting. A lot of clouds have a standard .rc type file that you can stick on your system. Um, there's a Nova RC for OpenStack. Uh, pretty standard if you're using AWS tooling to have a .AWS file. I forget the name of it. Um, Auto credentials will actually just scan your disk and go do I find any common um, credential files? And if so, it auto loads them in for you. So when you run those credentials next, you'll be off the races. So really good way to go. And then obviously, if you're going to have multiple credentials, you want to just have a default, the same default that you can change so that when you, you don't have to specify it every time. All right, so I've got a cloud. I've got credentials that someone's going to pay for that cloud usage. The next thing I need to do is get Juju running. And really, the heart of what, is, what Juju is, is a controller. You will run a, we'll show a bootstrap command, we'll get you a controller. And it's the key service that stores and tracks and provides all the information about the state of your model. And not only that, it does it for multiple models. And we'll talk about models in a second. And so, Juju is a very event-driven system. Uh, the charms go through and trigger events. Users issue commands that trigger events. And the controller is managing those events on what needs to happen, where and what way, depending on what building blocks you stack together um, to make sure that your model comes to fruition. And at the end of the day, the, the controller provides an API endpoint that all Juju clients, be it a GUI, a command line, or even all the running uh, applications themselves, all talk through to track everything there. Cool. And uh, so that's nothing a little database to keep track of it. So what you'll find is we'll have to run a bootstrap command. Now you can just run Juju Bootstrap and it will show you what clouds it knows about that are available and help walk you through the process, select the cloud, select the credential and go on. Or you can just basically single line this, right? Juju Bootstrap, my staging software controller, and I want to run it on Google. So you give it a name that's meaningful to you, and then what cloud it goes to, notice I didn't specify a credential, it's just going to use my default GT credentials on top of the so you issue that command, you get this, creating a Juju controller for using software, it tells you where it's creating it. Also notice that the region of the cloud is just picked out by the default, and you can override that. So you can look at all the different controllers you have. You can 
have uh, control in every cloud. Uh, you can run them, you know, locally, wherever you have them. You can list them out. Um, you can then show details about them. And so this is kind of a little bit of a visual visualization of what I'm talking about here, right? You've got your users, they're going to issue commands, they go across to the API points. The controller then handles mapping that down into the models that you're actually running. And the models are basically, what are you running in a nice, coherent um, uh, way? I don't know how many of you guys have ever like, deployed a lot of different stuff onto a cloud and then went to your AWS dashboard and saw instances like one through a hundred and you went, crap, I don't know what which one is which, and I hope when I hit the terminate button that this isn't our production email server, um, or the like. So models are great for helping you visualize exactly what it is you're working in. All right, so let's go try this out. So let's start with this. Let's use the word clouds. So here's my list of clouds in all the different regions. And so I said, let's show clouds. Gotta be bigger. I can. Let's see how this can go before it gets crazy. Thank you. Better? Yes. Awesome. All right, so I can show my information about Google, and you can see here that little details. The regions that are available, where the actual API points and things are. Um, typically, this should all come out of the box for you if you're adding your own cloud. Uh, you'll need to know the information that fits in here. So for your open stack, you'll need to know where are your endpoints for Keystone that you're going to add your community to and have that before. All right, so, and let's look at my credentials. So I've got credentials for AWS, Azure, GCE, my MAPS credentials, and Rackspace credentials. So I can basically just bootstrap onto any of these that we want, and I'm going to cheat. And let's go bootstrap on the controller using my C onto my local system. And that'll run through a pretty quick. So we'll cheat while that runs. Let's look at my running controllers. And you can see I've got three different ones. I've got a production AWS East one, a staging software one. Notice that the first one's running in the AWS, the second one's with Google, and the third one is my C one. And one thing I really want to show that's kind of cool here, well, we'll get that in the model section. Um, so there you go, three different files, three different controllers, switch between them, deploy my workloads in whatever one I want to get worked on today, and have it also have great reads and take advantage of performance of GCE, cost savings of AWS, uh, or the fact that I want to run locally um, with fast SSDs on my laptop. So, from that controller, I'm going to run many models. And a model is just a namespace of a controller uh, for tracking the same information of a set of running applications. You can have many, many models, name them whatever you'd like. Um, you can tear them up, tear them down. And one nice thing is that it's much faster to create a model than it is to do a controller. So, when you're working, you want to get a controller running, you just want to leave it up and leave it running. And then add it, or, you know, remove models as you need to get your work done. Right? Um, and then this is kind of the, the representation of the topology. This, this model is in summation. The applications that are running, the configuration management that's gone on to get them all running, how many units, what scale this thing is at, the constraints, are they on big machines or small machines? Um, Different resources, so for instance, when we talk about charms, we hear about resources, which are which actual binaries of things are running in the application, uh, network policy and uh, network layout, um, as well as placement details. Are things co located on the larger machines? Are they all running um, on the, you know, individually? So here is an example model. This is running a, a snapshot from the GGQ. You can see it's got, and it's got nine applications running across eight machines. Um, with different number of units, we've got three uh, the displays here, one's this one quarter, and this is your model. Cool. So you can obviously list your models, switch between them. Uh, you can even switch across controllers, so I can jump from a model on one controller to a model on another controller with this colon syntax. The controller colon the model, let me jump around. Scripting things is a really great way to make sure the script specifies the controller and the model so you don't accidentally run the script on the wrong place. Um, show details about it. So, 
in those models we're running what we call applications. And really, it's I have a charm that says how stuff is operated and, and, and what works, and an application is the running instance of that um, against the substrate. So this model can consist of three applications, uh, which are Apache, Django, and Postgres. And here in the GUI is just a single application running. You can see you can scale the units of it, you can scale that application, configure that application, expose it, upgrade it, um, or destroy it, and make it go away. So I'll kind of tie them together here. So deploy it, status it, scale it, configure it. Um, we'll set this log to false because we don't want this log today. Um, and then relations, we'll talk about it a little bit here. So how did that application come to be? I mean, that's the charm. And the charm is it's just a, it's an archive of scripts, as Mark said earlier. Um, in that script, there's all the operational know-how of what it takes to run that, to back it up, to make it talk to other pieces of software properly. You know, all the, the cheating and reuse uh, of that operational knowledge is all encapsulated in the charm. It's a very fundamental concept. So here's our Apache 2 charm. We have, uh, you know, read me about it. Uh, you can see on the right, if you go to uh, newcharm.com slash Apache 2, you can see the actual files that are in the charm, what the hooks are, what the hooks are doing. It's a, a you know, the read is a great way to understand how we use it, um, what all can I do with it, how can I use it, what can I connect it to. And eventually, the model is, is all this running, but at some point you want to replicate that model somewhere else. I want to deploy our, uh, our running web store on uh, in production with AWS. That's great, but I may want to also take that same thing and run it in GCE as a backup. You know, I want to fail over in another cloud or another region, maybe even another part of the world, to make sure that if all goes to hell, I've got a nice running backup, but it's the exact same model. It's the exact same applications, configuration, scale. All that's very reusable. And so a bundle is just a representation of that model that you can go take and deploy in whatever other you know, you can deploy over and over again to help you get this reuse out of this. So here is a uh, Kubernetes bundle. Um, you notice it's you know, a, a model of, of six different applications. They're all related, configured, and scaled. This is set up to be a very production, very Kubernetes. Deployment. And here's an example of kind of what this actually is. The bundle is just a YAML file. It says, Juju, do things in this way. You take this YAML file and you can take it anywhere. You can take it offline, you can take it and ship it to somebody else, you can put it in the charm store and share with others. But this is basically a nice offline, reusable, repeatable way of bringing up this Kubernetes install. And really, the bundles are just one command deploy them. Go get the bundle. Um, and then also, obviously, you can deploy the actual charms themselves. So, let's go deploy some stuff. So, models first. Let's look at my models I've got. Now, this is a brand new, this is that Lexi like one. So, I don't want to do this one. I want to go somewhere else. I want to go to my saving software controller. And on here, Alright, so I've got three different models on here. I'm on the default one. So I can look at what I've got running here. So I've got MediaWikium and uh, my SQL here related with one unit of each, the machines and all that started. What I wanted to do is show you guys a really cool thing we've recently done. Notice this is production AWS East One, which is great. So what I actually did from this controller running in AWS East One is I took my web store and I deployed it in both a West Coast and an East Coast model. So if you actually show the model for Web Store West. same controller. So it helps me control my expenses and my, you know, the amount of infrastructure I'm running in order to run infrastructure uh, by reusing that controller and creating the same model 
if we actually look at the status of these two, web authorities, we've got GeoDorm Postgres, which is uh, a browser data backend, and then I've got running a Django application, and let's check the West one. And it's the exact same thing. What I did is I basically created two models, put them in different regions, took the same bundle, deployed it in each model, and voila, lots of reuse, lots of repeatability, and lots of trust that I've gotten set up correctly and that they're mirroring each other very well. So, let's go. Actually, I hope one would deploy something. Uh, Web store development. So let's go ahead and take that same bundle. You know, I get this right. Live coding for the win. All right. So Django is the name of this bundle. And pretend my my app is my web store is a Django application. And voila, I'm deploying this now in LexD on my laptop. Someone I'm working on operating against the same exact stuff that's running in production two different regions. So it kind of really pulls together how we have a model, we can kind of export that as a model, and then we'll be using that for development, for staging, for testing, all the way through to production, and not just production, but a multi-region production. So charms and bundles, where do they come from? They come from the charm store. Um, JujuCharms.com is the charm store URL. You'll find documentation there. You'll find, uh, you can search for existing charms, existing bundles. You have your own namespace. You can log in with your Ubuntu SSO credentials. You can uh, upload your own bundles and charms there. You can even do it privately. So you can just use it as a resource to be able to publish and maintain a development workflow. And Mark will go through a lot of the charm related aspects of this. It is um, making of a charm talk that's on tomorrow morning. Now, you don't have to have yourself in the store. Juju obviously can deploy things locally. When you're doing things in testing development, you can say, hey, Juju deploy this directory, which would be a charm that I would upload. Um, and it will work just as fine. Uh, but what's great is that we talk about sharing of operational knowledge and engaging the community and getting the many eyes and sharing that operational cost. You know, I think there was a question earlier about people are comfortable with that Docker container because it's theirs and they built it. I said, yeah, that's great up until what happens the developer says, here, operations guys, here's a Docker container, go put it in production. And the operations guy goes, great, but how do I ship my logs to syslog over here? And how do I hook it up to Navios for monitoring? And how do I this and that and this and that? And the developer goes, that's not my problem. It runs. It passes unit tests. It's great. Um, and so by putting the charm in the store and engaging the community around it, you get folks who care about using it with Navios and doing proper monitoring to participate in the charm, to add that functionality. People that really want to care about how that database gets backed up in a way that doesn't block it so that your web app is basically down whenever you actually need to back up. Um, and, and really get that collaboration going by sharing across the charm store. So here's a lovely picture of the design team put together. All right, and so for the less practice here, well, my intent is really just to demonstrate, here's the charm store. I've got Apache Linux, uh, Apache Analytics bundle. Um, the readme, here's where I'm talking about the files that kind of go into it. I can see the license, I can see the actual YAML file. What's really great is these things have tests, so I can actually trust that what's here and published in the store has some form of testing against it, uh, history for it, and then the readme that those <coughs> here that is calling out actions, um, basically predefined and operational know how package off into it that I get to read without having to go through that work and figuring it out myself. So please, I would encourage everyone to go play in the store, um, search for things. Here's the anonymous component cluster. We need an icon for that. That's too anonymous. Um, we can go from there. Alright. So we get our shelf deployed. Now, what really I find makes Juju really unique and exciting and interesting is this idea of the relation. And a relation is the, uh, the interconnectivity or interoperability part that Mark was talking about. That idea that um, an app, the Django app can say, look, I, I talk HTTP. Okay, that's great. Got a Django app, it talk HTTP. What does that mean? Well, that means that you can write charms that also talk HTTP and do things with it. 
And on the surface, that sounds very boring, but if you look at any kind of web thing in production, what do you do? You put them behind load balancers. You put them behind caching servers. You put them up to uh, you know, actual web front ends and SSL termination. Like, how many guys terminate uh, actual SSL on the Django application itself running its own web server? No. You hook it up to Apache. Apache does the actual SSL termination. You put that you know, uh, in front of either, say, a squid uh, HTTP uh, caching proxy or something so that you can get caching of your pages and stuff through that. And what's nice is you get to plug and play all these bits based on how you want to take your thing to production in a way that's completely very reusable, um, switchable. You get this idea of uh, you can substitute out, I'm not an Apache shop, I'm an Nginx shop. That's great. Nginx charm talks HTTP as well. So as long as anything's talking that protocol, you get this enormous flexibility and can trust that it will all, you know, quote unquote, plug and play just work. Now, there's a lot of work that's gone on by the folks that wrote those charms to make sure they do the right things with that protocol. But again, as an end user of it, it's a lot of work that I didn't have to figure out how to write a proper, you know, any file for an Nginx to get it to do reverse proxying on my Django app for me, right? Beautiful. I love it. Um, so, to kind of play that game, here's uh, MediaWiki talking to MySQL. Standard. Do it all the time. Except, you know what, I, you know, Oracle's great, but I don't like their minus go. I like their own cluster and its HA ability. So I'm going to take that same video with me, break this relation here, and have a relation of our own cluster, and my leaky just works. Now, leaky is pretty, you know, pretty rudimentary, but if you take that idea further, um, this actually happened with our open stack installs. If you look at the canonical open stack, big array of massive numbers of applications working together. Right? They're, they were started out with MySQL and had a database on that. But they couldn't make that open stack as HA and for as resilient as they wanted with MySQL from Oracle. So they went and grabbed the Cohen cluster, which is a fork of MySQL that works a lot like it, and managed to plug that in instead. And they didn't have to go rework it. You know? They didn't have to figure out how to add that functionality to MySQL. They used the best of breed for what they needed out there in the world to put it to work. So we can remove the relation, we then just relate it to the other ones related to your community instead, and voila. Now, that's great, we're talking about applications and things, but at the end of the day, we're, we're putting this up in the cloud because we want the flexibility to be able to scale this. Right? If I'm on my developer laptop, I may only run one unit, and a unit is basically a single instance of that application running. And basically, it's, it could be in a VM, in a container, on a bare metal, on a server, it's just one of them. If I have one VOE or one uh, Redis or one uh, Cassandra database. But that's, that's great for testing does my app work, does the code work. But when I go to staging or I go to production or I bring up another production instance, I don't want just one. I want as many as I need to serve my workload. And this is where the charms encapsulate the knowledge of what it means to add another unit. Okay. It's not as simple as just saying, all right, I'm going to you know, go to one VM and deploy uh, Redis, go to another one and deploy Redis. Magically, somehow figure out how to cross collaborate and share the load? No. There has to be an operational knowledge of how you take these two Redis's, put them on the same network, uh, make sure that they're configured to collaborate together as a single, uh, I forget what the Redis term is now. Basically, this is the same thing space, such that then when request, requests come in to Redis, that they will actually get sharded out between them and you'll be able to scale up. And we do that with units. And the command for that is. Pretty self explanatory, you add a unit. So, what's really great is if you have a Redis charm and it knows how to scale and you need more scale, it's as simple as you should add a unit or let's get it. I mean, come on, who adds one more? We don't add one more. We want three more. We want 10 more. You know, we want 15 more. We want to see how, at what point does Memcache fall over because the, the cost of communicating amongst all the units is too expensive for what it's actually doing. You know? Let's go find out. We can do it with the charm really easily. Right, if you were to, to task your guys for how far can we push our memcache setup, they would have to sit down for a week and get all the hardware together and then figure out okay, how we're going to set it all up, how we're going to test it, all that kind of stuff. You know? This is, keep adding units until your benchmark tool falls over. Talk to Mark, he'll talk about the benchmark tool that can help you better uh, validate that. Alright, so all our stuff's running. This is great. I can do things. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, an island of one is 
not very useful because I like to go on vacation once in a while, go up in the mountains and do some hiking and such. When I do that, my stuff can't just fall over or be unusable. So Jiji is the you know, basic idea of users, and you can add users to your models, to your controllers, and give them uh, permissions to be able to come in and help operate stuff while you're away on holiday. And the great thing is that since so much of the operational knowledge is encapsulated in the charm, they can not just do whatever they They can either add more, they can reinstall some things, but because the model is consistent, you're just fluctuating kind of some of the implementation details of that model. Um, it's a great way to collaborate with other people, particularly ones that may not have the same day in and day out know-how that you have. So I can add Marco. I'm going to add him to my controller. Um, that will actually give me a register command. It will say, did you register? And then I think blah, blah, blah. And this is our way of, you can email that to Marco and say, Marco, run this command. And it will set up and ask him, what would you like to call this new controller that you got from Rick? He can call it whatever he wants. Rick wants me to do work for him, as you know. Um, and then at that point, Marco has uh, permissions to log into the controller, but I haven't given him any access to any models yet. So now I have to grant Marco access. I'm going to give him read access to my default model, which means, ha ha, Marco, you can see it because you can audit it. You can do my report for me on the audit. And, but you can't actually monkey with it, do anything with it. Um, or I can actually give Marco a model and then grant him access to it. So now, Marco can come do his work. I'm running the controller. I'm paying the bill for the expenses with my credentials. But Marco can go into this model and deploy his workload and things, and he has very kind of limited focused access uh, to get his work done. So I was going to do that. I wanted to see who the heck has access to the controller. Uh, so you want to be able to you know, list your users, show details about the user Marco, when was the last time you logged in, is he actually doing any of the work I asked him to do or not. Um, and then what's interesting is if I show a model, I actually get the access of who has access at what well, at ACL levels to this model. So okay, this is just my peace of mind to make sure that Marco's um, doing what he's supposed to be doing here. So let's go back and let's play with this, right? So my controllers, I think I added Marco to my staging software controller. Oops, not like not want to use the switch today. All right, so let's. Check these here. Marco goes, I can't get my belt on it. Well, yes, you can. I just listed users and I can see that you have access, so get to work, Marco. Um, and then I can show you that Marco, and I can see that he's never connected, so he never responded to my registered email. I will have to go and resend it again and again. And then let's look at the models. So I created the Go Marco Go model, so I can show model Go Marco Go. Here in this user section here, I'm the admin. I connected two hours ago, and Marco is a user. He is never connected, but he does have access at the admin level. So just to kind of quickly mention, there's three levels of access. There's kind of admin, read, and write. Okay. So if you think about it, read self-explanatory. You can go in, you can run your status, you can even load a Juju GUI, you can see what's going on, but you can't actually affect the model at all. Uh, write means you can affect the model. You can deploy new things. You can Change the configuration, you can scale up and scale down things. And the reason we have admin is because there's this general idea can you share this model with someone else? If you're not an admin, then you can't add other people. So I can make sure that by adding you, I didn't just open a giant black door so you and all your buddies are not participating in my model using my cloud credentials to you know, run stuff. It's just you, we're working together, we're buddies. Time. When you deploy a charm, you can actually give it whatever name you want. So 
An interesting thing here would be, do you deploy PostgreSQL um, as, I'm going to call it PSQL <laughs> backup. So it'll take the PostgreSQL charm, but it'll give it that name in my model, and I can do this over and over again with different names, and then I can actually have interconnectivity between those PostgreSQLs with relations that might do something. The other thing might just be an action. Uh, actions are kind of charm, are kind of a script that encapsulates some operational know-how. So you may have a backup and restore action, or even a, if you want to have a live transfer action. And so what it would be is you could basically create an action that takes an input of, say, an IP address of a Postgres that you would like to live transfer data to. So you would create this script that would go through and actually do the jump restore live or whatnot, taking an input where you want it to go, and then you can encapsulate that knowledge on the screen, put it in a charm, you share it, and then everyone who uses that charm now gains the ability to do kind of live migration of data across Postgres themselves. So you deploy a second time with a different name, run an action across it, and call it a day. Woo! Yeah, the rest, yeah. Well, do you have a Juju install feature somewhere? Yeah, so we're going to, because there's different operating systems and all that. We didn't go through install steps. We're going to do this in the, the hands-on time after the, the talks today. Um, we have a get started. If you go to the jujucharms.com, wrong one. One of these I thought. Here we go. Uh, into the documentation, <coughs> you start right out on getting started with uh, Juju2. Um, it walks you through the process of doing this with LexD locally. You know, no cost, no credentials, very fast, so kind of your fault there. But you'll find the links and information for getting uh, the clients on other operating systems or uh, setting up other clouds through the documentation. But since we've got folks in orange shirts and a lot of Chronicle folks here, you know, grab someone and we'll help walk you through the process. Cool. Anything else? How are we doing, Marco? Can't find the five I'm going to work for a record. <laughs> um, good, I just kind of want to work through time, actually. So, um, yeah. Are there any questions? Yeah, that's, that's what I was just doing. I was just, yeah. Yeah. For any questions, I prefer a lot of stuff. I basically put you um, up for a lot of work later on. So of course. Um, so some of it is in real life. Um, so, don't have any questions? I know this is a pretty good overview of introduction to Juju. We have some track time set out to after lunch. So if you're still a little fuzzy on how to get started, we'll be walking around. There's a lot of us here who know how to install Juju and help get started. Um, most everyone who signed up for Cloud Credentials should have an email on how to get those credentials. So this afternoon, if you're looking to get started, we're walking around getting set up so that you can walk through the things that uh, Rick showed you. We'll get you set up with Juju install. We'll get your credentials loaded in that we provided for you. We'll get you with a controller set up so you can start poking around this a little more, maybe getting some more questions. Uh, uh, cool. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rick. So we're going to move on to talk. Question? Oh, question. Um, yeah. So it's kind of curious how we force people to do graceful shutdowns of systems. How do people, how do people do graceful shutdowns of systems? So when you're wanting to take something offline, for instance? Yeah, you, like let's say I've got a customer on one of your, your yeah. e commerce things, and I don't want that customer to just wrong. So um, you should chat with our OpenStack team. In order to uh, maintenance operations, basically to pull things out of a pool, to gracefully pull them kind of out, shut down. They've done a lot of work in the OpenStack charms that have basically actions that take things and they put them into a maintenance mode. That maintenance mode will then trigger scripts that will go through and say pull it from a uh, load balancer or whatnot. And then uh, once that's offline, we'll make sure all the, all the work that's going on in that unit get handed off to somebody else or it waits until that's done before it actually gets pulled um, to help kind of handle that kind of maintenance stuff. Uh, basically, you can give someone access with Juju, I mean, and they can run Juju as a SSH to machine. But actually, in theory, you could give folks access to the model without having actual direct access on the machines themselves. And so charms are an interesting way. I haven't seen many folks do this yet, but I'm curious as this grows as a way of, um, I can see folks that do operations handing off to developers or other folks a charm where they can, they can only interact through the charm. They can only set the config that the charm exposes. They can only trigger actions that are defined in the charm. And it's a way of saying, look, Postgres can be set up a billion different ways, but in this, in this company, we set it up this way with these standards and, and these, this config and all that. You can actually ship that to them 
it as a charm, kind of prepackaged in the safety netted like worlds that sit and use. And so they can't, I mean, in theory, yes, they could SSH to it and do, you know, shut down that page now or whatnot on it. But if you don't actually give SSH access to it, the only they can do is whatever the charm exposes. If the charm doesn't have a shut down button, they can either destroy it, which means that it takes the whole database down and the charm goes away or whatnot. Or, again, two actions that are exposed, prepare to shut down, you know, like, prepare to fire, prepare to fire, you know, uh, and you can actually enforce things that way. By all means, I'll happily share. Oh, sorry, I'm here to repeat your questions. Um, are we sharing the presentation somewhere? Uh, sure, I will happily share it to Marco, who seems to have a lot of your email addresses now. And can get yeah, it out. so uh, James, who's been very nice to be recording these sessions, he will be rapidly editing them so that we'll have slides and video together. We'll be uploading to YouTube, if not this week, then early next week. Um, so we'll make sure that if you sign up on the event, right, we'll be sending out an email with the summary when the videos are up, so you have those links for reference. We'll have the slides in the video description. James, what's your last name? Donner. What's that? Donner. Donner. That's right. Like the party. So here you go. I have shared it with James. That's not his problem. Woo -hoo, woo! All right. <laughs> Delegation for the win. Anything else? Going once, going twice. All right. If you guys need anything at all, um, I'm the big bald guy walking around. Feel free to stop and ask me anything. Um, and if I can't answer it, I have names. One more. One more. One more. Sarah. Security. So is there a security scan so you know the charms are safe? Um, there's a couple mechanisms we have to kind of res respond to that question. Um, one of them is, as, as Mark kind of alluded to, we come from a bunch of land, we come from Debian land and open source world. We believe that eyeballs and use of things is a natural scan. So we have um, a community of charmers. Uh, we have a set of charms that have kind of gone through a community review. And I believe there's a session on what it takes to be a charmer later on. And so it kind of goes through, so that when there are there are certain charms, you notice when I just do you deploy, I guess maybe that's what I need to do. I deploy PostgreSQL. It just said PostgreSQL. I would say like, there's there's a dozen PostgreSQLs in the charm store, but there's only one that's gone through the charm review process that has had eyeballs on it, that has kind of some sense of uh, security on that, like there are eyeballs on it that we can guarantee, right? I could also go through and deploy. Um, I'm going to pretend James B here has a PostgreSQL. I don't know why that your name popped in my head there. Sorry. Um, PostgreSQL. And this would go to James's personal namespace and grab a PostgreSQL charm that he runs and operates. That's not merged with the, the one that's been reviewed or whatnot. I don't know what he's doing. This is James' way to help earn money on the side because he key loggers everything. And all my user data is in there now. I don't know. Um, so that doesn't have that guarantee. Okay? The other thing, though, is that when you get a charm, you get raw files. There's, there's no hidden hex code stuff like, I mean, it's, if you look at the actual code in these charms, um, so here's what we're going to cluster. You know, you go look at what happens when you run a hook. You can go in and, and, and see it and actually audit it and look at it and get confidence that there's nothing shady. They're just, they're just normal, typically Python scripts. Very readable. You can see if it's fetching from an external resource. Um, we're very much encouraging charms to work in an offline mode, such that we can go to like a big corporate deployment where they don't have an open firewall. You can deploy an application and trust that it will work without having to go out to the internet to fetch stuff. Stuff like that, I mean, that's just your, your network setup can help secure that you can be aware that the charm is not able to go out and pull random pseudo bash thing from the internet um, as well. So there's, there's a few avenues, you know, there's community process, there's just the, the, the flat out visibility, that, you know, honest visibility that you get out of it. Um, that one was more promising. There we go, we're coming up with stuff on yeah, it. Anyway, so a lot of, you'll find in charms a lot of times things are assembling around or whatnot. So there's actually one file that has a lot of logic. And then you'll see the charm layers work, cleans up the code a lot. So, anyways, that would be my response to that. Any other questions? Uh, it's all great so far. So if you have any questions, again, we'll be around. We're happy to answer them. Track time doesn't have to do where you can get one on one time to really hammer Rick or any of us about how we handle security and charms. We're happy to go a little deeper into that. Uh, so thank you, Rick. All right.